Hi, my name is Brandy Jones. I'm a postdoctoral fellow with the NAI Center for Ribosomal Origins and Evolution at Georgia Tech. And today I want to talk to you about a special group of extremophiles. They were kind of skipped um, during the morning session, but they're rotifers. They're eukaryotes, they're microscopic animals, and they live in very diverse habitats. And my work focuses on the molecular biology of um, how they're able to survive in those habitats. And we know a lot is known about prokaryotes, but very little is known about eukaryotes, extremophiles. So that's what my work focuses on. Just some examples of where you can find rotifers. Um, they live in alkaline lakes, acidic lakes. Um, you can find them in hypersaline habitats, as well as I know we've heard a lot about Dry Valley in Antarctica. You can find them there as well. They also um, are able to adapt to their habit the habitats in which they live, where if you get extreme desiccation, they can go from a very um, active living form to a desiccated dormant form that upon rehydration years later will be become active adult and able to um, metabolize, metabolize. And just to give you an idea, the adult can go from active swimming to that desiccated form within 30 minutes. And upon rehydration, you get the active swimming adult form within the same time period. And so my question is, how do the ribosomes, how are they able to survive and um, become active when that, within that short of a time period? The model organism for my study is Brachionis mahavacus. It's a rotifer, a microscopic aquatic organism. It's able to withstand extreme heat, desiccation, UV irradiation. And this here is a female carrying asexual eggs. Um, they undergo both asexual and sexual life cycles. Usually it's asexual where they develop the asexual eggs, but if you get some type of um, environmental cue or signal, um, usually it's environmental stress, they, it triggers them to go into a sexual life cycle where they produce these resting eggs that can remain dormant for hundreds of years. They can become um, completely desiccated. You can expose them to extreme heat, UV irradiation, but upon rehydration, they're able to continue developing into normal adults. And this is just an experiment I did with the active um, rotifers, adult rotifers from three different species. And then those desiccated forms that I was just telling you about. If you incubate, and on, this is a survival ship curve, and if on the y-axis is the proportion surviving, on the x is the temperature exposed to. So the adults, when exposed to temperatures higher than 40 degrees, they die. But those um, dormant cysts, you can expose them to temperatures greater than 100 degrees, and then upon rehydration, they go on metabolizing. So they're very, um, they can withstand extreme temperatures. So my goal is to gather insight on how the ribosomes are able to withstand those environmental stresses, um, how once you remove those organisms from the environmental stress, the ribosomes are able to continue translating and um, form proteins. So what I know from other eukaryotes is that usually when you have some type of environmental stress, translation of housekeeping genes and um, normal genes, they, it stops. The ribosome will fall apart you'll get the small subunit falls apart from the large subunit, and the small subunit um, associates with proteins known to um, initiate translation, as well as mRNAs that are not being translated, and they move into these stress granules. And here's just an example from a human cell line. Here we're looking at, and we're just, we've um, tagged the proteins fluoresce with fluorescent markers. You, this is from a paper from 2009. You have the large subunit in green, the small subunit in red, and then you have a um, initiation factor shown here in blue. Upon a stress with arsenite, you get co-localization of the large, the small subunit as well as the initiation factor, but the large subunit doesn't co-localize with them. And this right here is what we call a stress granule. You see it here. And shown over here is the same thing. These three proteins are three initiation factors. Upon um, stress, you get co-localization of all three proteins and um, stress granule production. 
So my hypothesis is that these stress granules form in the rotifers during periods of environmental stress, and they protect the ribosome during those periods, and then upon removal of the environmental stress, you get um, reassociation of the ribosome, and the organisms are able to go on metabolizing. So what I know from previous studies done with both yeast and mammalian cells is that unstressed cells do not have stress granules. They're not present. Heat, upon heat stress, you get stress granule production, as well as starvation, hyperosmolarity. And then if you incubate them in the presence of an antibiotic called cyclohexamide, it um, inhibits stress granule formation. But the antibiotic pyromycin promotes stress granule formation. So I decided to test all of these conditions with my rotifers. And the different environmental stresses I used were osmotic stress. You normally um, grow the rotifers in fifth, um, artificial seawater containing 15 PPT salt. I varied it up to 45 PPT. I deprived them of nutrients for several days, and then I heat shocked them. And I did all of those things, and then I followed the movement of three proteins known to be associated with stress granules. The three proteins are TIA1, it's an RNA binding protein, um, it's involved in mRNA splicing, and then two eukaryotic initiation factors, EIF4E and EIF3B. All three of these proteins are known to co-localize the stress granules upon um, stress, environmental stress in yeast and mammalian cells. So just so you can follow the rest of my experiments, to follow the proteins, I used anti antibodies and they were fluorescently tagged. So here, TIA1 will always appear red in my pictures, EIF3B will appear magenta, EIF4E will be green, and then the DNA in some pictures are stained with DAPI, and it appears blue. And this is just an example of the microscopy pictures you'll see. Here's a bright fill image showing just the rotifer. Here's a confocal image. Um, you see the nuclei, and some of the red and magenta, and some of the green, and those are the three proteins. And wherever those proteins co-localize, you'll see a yellow or orange color shown here, here, here. And then I have them labeled so you can see the organs um, in which they co-localized. So in my first experiment, I deprived them of nutrients um, for 48 hours. And just so you can see each column here is the individual protein that I followed. So EIF3B, you, as you continue with starvation, you see aggregation of EIF3B as well as EIF4E and TIA1. They each begin to aggregate amongst themselves. But then I'm showing you a merged image, and you can see that they're co-localizing to the same location. And just in case you can't see what I see, I use software that um, labels white anywhere those three proteins co-localize. So you see, as you increase the time period of starvation, you get an increase of co-localization of the three proteins within the major organ systems, which is indicative of stress granule formation. And here I've just zoomed in, and you see the yellow and orange here. I've also done some statistical analysis using a Manders coefficient. Um, Zero, um, the, the coefficient, when you get a zero, it means there's no co-localization of the proteins, and a one means perfect co-localization. And you can see it goes from 0.344 at 24 hours, and it peaks at 0.7 um, at 48 hours. Does that mean five left or left? Okay. <laughs> okay, and then my next experiment is osmotic shock where I varied it from the 15 PPT ASW to the 35 um, PPT. So the 15 PPT is the control. And as you see, as we increase the um, osmolarity, you get an increase in aggregation of each of the individual proteins. It's not as dramatic as we saw before in the nutrient deprivation, but you do see co-localization. And it goes from 0.37 in the control to 0.79. Um, so that's indicative of co-localization and stress granule formation. I, under heat stress, 
I varied the time that we heat shocked them from zero to 20 minutes. And you see the same pattern. You see an increase in aggregation of each of the individual proteins and an increase in co-localization in the um, major organ, organ systems, um, which is like the other is indicative of co-localization and stress granule formation. So here I wanted to show you that the stress granule formation is dynamic. You get stress granules form, but when you remove the stress, those stress granules go, go away. So here at um, unstressed rotifers, you don't see any of those aggregations and co-localization. You see it with 30 minutes of heat stress. And then I let them recover for three hours. So I put them back at their normal um, temperature to um, grow, and that was room temperature. And you see a decrease in the amount of stress granules formed. So these stress granules are dynamic. They um, form, and then they dissipate. And here, the antibiotic pyromycin that's known to promote stress granule formation in other organisms, we see that when you incubate them with the pyromycin and the heat stress, you get um, a dramatic amount of stress granules forming. And then the other antibiotic cyclohexamide that's known to prevent stress granule formation um, does the same here. You don't see any co-localization of those proteins. And here, um, it's a deviation from my other pictures. The green here is actually um, the large ribosomal subunit. I labeled it, I um, labeled pyromycin with the um, green fluorescent, well, here is FITC, which is green. And then I incubated it with the rotifers after they had been heat stressed. So it's going to bind to the large ribosomal subunit, which is known in other organisms not to um, move into stress granules, is usually on the periphery. And you see aggregation with heat stress. So these are the other two um, proteins that you saw before. You see that they're co-localizing like they did before the red and magenta. But the green, which is the large ribosome subunit, is not co-localizing with the um, stress granules. So um, just in conclusion, what I've seen in rotifers is consistent with what we see in both yeast and mammalian cells that um, in unstressed cells, you do not get stress granule formation. But in all the environmental um, stresses that we tested, we got stress granule formation, just as you see in yeast and mammalian cells. The antibiotic cyclohexamide prevented stress granule formation, and pyromycin promoted it. And the um, components of the stress granules in rotifers were consistent with what we see in other organisms. So just what I can conclude from this study is that the stress granules are most probably of an ancient origin because you see them early in the evolution of animals, rotifers, as well as in um, mammals. And I want to thank um, the labs I work with, the Snell Lab um, at the School of Biology at Georgia Tech, the Williams Lab in the School of Chemistry at Georgia Tech, and the Dunham Lab at Emory, as well as NASA and my center, um, the Center for Ribosomal Origins and Evolution. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Brandy? Hi. Sorry if I missed this, but is there anything special about the stress granules of the rotifers that makes them better able to withstand um, stress? So that would be um, what I want to determine later on, we don't know now, it's the first time they've ever been seen in rotifers, but I would like to see if the stress granules form quicker in rotifers, if, you, if they're more dynamic, I'm not sure, but that's something I definitely want to look into. Hi, could you go back to your slide with the, uh, the heat stress over time uh, earlier, earlier? Yeah, that one. At the very bottom with the T1A1, where it's not showing any sort of, any, any red down, yes. What's going on there? I mean, why has it just disappeared, do you think? It has a lot of it. I don't know if you can Am I see not it. seeing it? Yeah, it has a lot of it. Oh, okay, because, all right, maybe I'm just red blind for the bottom there, but I just don't see anything. Yeah, it's, it's there. Um, I do think, I agree that there is more here than there, but it's still a lot um, present. But I, I think there is a limit to the stress granules form. They're supposed to be dynamic. And I really didn't give um, the 
animals an opportunity to adjust like they would normally do. I just take them and move them from their normal um, growth temperature to this um, heat shock and normally they would have time to acclimate to it. So I think probably 20 minutes was pushing the limit for them and so they start to kind of die. What was the, uh, you used pyromycin and what was the other? Cyclohexamide. Do you know how that uh, works, how that antibiotic um, so cyclohexamide prevents elongation and pyramycin prevents initiation of um, translation. And the pre when you prevent initiation, it promotes a, a signal, a signaling cascade that promotes these stress granules formation. And the cyclohexamide, because you're stopping it at a different time point, it doesn't um, start that cascade, that signaling cascade, the same one. Right. Would it be worth looking at other antibiotics to give you clues about, you know, there, how these um, they have been, like with yeast and mammalian cells, there are, there are a number of different um, antibiotics that they have looked at, and that just grabbed two from the list. But if you, um, the antibiotics that prevent an initiation of translation all promote stress granule hmm. um, formation because you end up getting um, phosphorylation of one of the initiation right. factors. So thank you, Brandy. Thank you.